my name is Vincent, and uh, this is Thomas. We are software engineers at Salesforce on the Big Data team. And we're going to be presenting on um, integrating Apache Phoenix with distributed query engines, namely uh, Presto and Spark. So yeah, just a quick outline. We'll talk about the Presto connector first, then the Spark, and then if we have time, we'll go into a demo. Um, so I don't know how familiar people are with Presto, but I'll just give a quick introduction to Presto. So Presto, what is Presto? It's a distributed SQL query engine for running interactive analytic queries on big data sets. Um, so it's really meant for late infancy sensitive use cases. So that would be things like visualizations, dashboards, um, business intelligence tools, things like that. So typically for queries that finish in seconds or minutes. Um, originally developed at Facebook and then open source in 2013. It's ANSI SQL compliant. And um, if you guys are familiar with AWS Athena or Google BigQuery, uh, those are very similar to Presto. And actually Athena is Presto. Um, so then I guess at this point in presentation, people might ask why build a Phoenix connector for Presto? Because Phoenix is a distributed query engine and why do we need Presto? Um, I think that'll become self-evident over the course of this presentation, so I'll save that for the end. Um, this is a comparison of Hive with Presto. So Hive is MapReduce based. Um, and so this was kind of the original motivation for developing Presto because um, Hive, it was very kind of um, higher latency because you had all these intermediate stages that wrote to disk in MapReduce. And whereas Presto, you can think of it as a in-memory pipeline all the way from the client to the data source. Um, this is what the architecture of Presto looks like. So you have a client that uh, sends a query to a coordinator node. There's a single coordinator which uh, builds the query plan and then it generates tasks for workers and it sends out the tasks to the workers which then talk to connector plugins which in turn talk to the underlying backend store um, which could any be anything like Hive, Cassandra uh, and now Phoenix. This is a, another view of um, the, what the architecture looks like. So again, at the top, we have the coordinator. And um, at the bottom, we have the workers. So the boxes in red here, those are what the connectors would have to implement. If you, so if you want to write a connector for Presto, you would implement these red boxes. Um, so again, the query goes to a coordinator where it's dequeued, and then it goes through a query optimizer and planner which talks to your connectors metadata API to get information like what tables you have, what columns, what data types, et cetera. And then your query gets uh, scheduled. Um, it uses a data location API, which uh, tells it uh, the location of your data. So uh, you, know, you could have data locality, for instance, if you had Presto running on the same nodes as your Hadoop data nodes. Um, and then the workers at the bottom, they use your connectors data source uh, to talk to the external storage system. So this is what a query plan in Presto looks like. Um, so at the top here, we have a SQL query that uses some of the most common SQL constructs. So you're doing a select count star. Um, you have two tables, orders, and customer that you're joining. And we're doing a group by. And then we are also doing an order by and then a limit. And so um, what happens is your query is broken down into different stages. So at the very bottom stage here um, is the actual table scan of the underlying uh, data source. And then that data gets fed up to the next stage where it's, so at the bottom we're, we're scanning two different tables and then that gets passed up to the stage above which does the join and the projection which then passes data up uh, to the stage above that, which is doing the aggregation, and then at the very top, we're doing the top end limit. Um, and this is all, again, in memory. So yeah, we wrote a Presto Phoenix connector. Um, and this, is, this was a pull request, um, so I actually do have some breaking news. Um, as of last night, this actually got merged into the official Presto SQL uh, repo. 
So um, I think the next release is 3.12. So in Presto 3.12, uh, Phoenix connector will be included as part of the distribution. So to understand the Phoenix uh, Presto connector, it's helpful to kind of talk about the Phoenix MapReduce framework because it's pretty similar. So first of all, why do we need a Phoenix MapReduce framework? Phoenix, again, is already a you know, query engine. Why do we need MapReduce? Well, it's useful for long running queries that read most or all of your data. Um, and so the way it works is we put your query through the query planner the same way as we normally do. Um, we then get the parallel scans uh, from the query plan. And that means there's uh, one scan per region typically, or if you have stats enabled, it's one scan per guidepost. And so normally Phoenix client would execute these in parallel, but what we do in the MapReduce framework is then we extract the HBase scans from these uh, Phoenix queries, and then we create one mapper per scan and then execute these mappers in Yarn. So the uh, Presto connector is very similar. So again, we run the query through the planner. We get the parallel HBase scans. Now instead, we create a Presto split for each scan. And uh, what this does is we're reusing the, so Presto already supports um, JDBC. So there's a bunch of JDBC connectors, like there's MySQL, there's Postgres, et cetera. Um, so our Phoenix connector is very similar to those because we also support JDBC. Um, the key difference is that, so for those uh, relational databases, you don't need multiple splits. They would just have a single split because traditionally in those relational databases, you know, it's not distributed. Um, but now for Phoenix, we do have many splits. And then uh, we wrap each scan in a result set and then we feed it into the Presto JDBC connector and then those splits get executed by the Presto workers. So there is a limitation to the Phoenix MapReduce framework. And I got this, this is a screenshot from the Phoenix website. So the arrow is pointing to uh, the note here that says, the select query must not perform any aggregation or use distinct as these are not supported by our MapReduce integration. So why are these not supported? Well, if you think about it, so the mappers are just uh, scanning data, right? Um, so in order to do an aggregation, you would need to aggregate the results from each, from all your mappers. And to do that, you probably want to write a reducer uh, to do that. And no one's ever kind of done that. And if you were to do that, you'd basically be on the path to rewriting Hive from scratch, right? Because, um, yeah. But now, so um, this gets into why you would want a Phoenix connector for Presto. So now with Presto, um, this is the slide from earlier, remember the uh, query plan here. So at the very bottom is again where we're reading from the underlying data source and that's where the Phoenix connector split is um, reading from Phoenix, right? And so now we get all the stages above for free from Presto. So now Presto can do the aggregations and distinct for us. Uh, another big uh, reason why you'd want to use um, a Phoenix connector for Presto is now you can join data across multiple different HBase clusters. So here at the bottom, you know, I have, you know, HBase cluster in US West and another one in HBase or US East. And they are running in parallel stages that get, that have their data passed up to the stage above, which does the join. So now you can effectively uh, do federation across multiple Phoenix clusters. Um, and finally, like the other reason why you might want to use a uh, Phoenix connector for Presto is that you can join your Phoenix data with other data sources. And this is where the power of Presto really comes in, right? Um, so traditionally, uh, you would do your OLAP on column-oriented files like ORC. And then your, typically people use Phoenix for OLTP. Well, now you can have data in both and uh, you can join them and also, you know, so you might want some data in Phoenix because it's mutable data, whereas ORC is immutable, but now you can kind of join the mutable and immutable data. And so in terms of future work for this connector, so Presto um, has currently only been pushing down predicates. 
So that would be like the where clause um, where the, the filter in your query. And so now they're doing work to uh, support more complex uh, pushdown. So that would be pushdown of aggregations and joins. And that's really important for Phoenix because Phoenix can push down uh, aggregates to the HBase coprocessor, right? So, um, so our, the performance would improve significantly, I think, if uh, we could do this. And then also um, a thing for the future is to integrate Phoenix stats um, with Presto. So Presto has a cost-based optimizer, but um, in order to calculate the costs of uh, different query plans, you need the stats, right? And so you could do things like join reordering if you had that. Um, so yeah, that's the Presto connector, and now Thomas will talk about the Spark connector. Uh, so I'll give a, uh, a short background on, on Spark and MapReduce. So I'm sure most of us are familiar with uh, the MapReduce uh, framework. Uh, basically, you have three phases in MapReduce, a map phase where you uh, where you perform a mapping function that generates a key and a value on data, uh, on a you know on distributed data, on distributed data basically. Uh, then there's a shuffle phase where you shuffle where you know all the data from a particular key is moved to a single node so that all uh, all values for a key are uh, resident on a single server. And then there's a reduce phase where you know you you where all the groups of uh, values per key are processed parallelly. Um, so, so, so basically, the, the benefit of MapReduce is um, there are, you know you can move the compute to where your data is located, so you you minimize your network overhead. Uh, MapReduce also provides certain uh, you know, automatic recovery. So, like let's say a, a map task fails, you can the the framework will automatically uh, schedule another mapper so that your job can complete with the automatic retry logic. Uh, so, so there's, so, so MapReduce, the, Map, the MapReduce framework is useful for, for a lot of applications, but there are certain applications where uh, if you try to implement using MapReduce, your job will take a really long time. So two, the two, kind, two specific applications are like iterative algorithms where you're running machine learning or ad hoc data mining where you're repeatedly querying the same data set again and again. So in both of these cases, you are re re reusing a data set. And each time you need to load that data set into memory from disk. And so each time you load the net, you know, each time you load the same data from disk, uh, you're, you, you need to do all, you hit and you need, it takes a really long time to load, to load data because of uh, the IO, IO overhead. Um, so, so one of the goals of the Spark framework was to extend the MapReduce model to better solve these particular use cases. Um, and so Spark was written in the Scala programming language, which is a functional programming language uh, that is really concise, so it's easy for interactive use. Uh, so the Spark CLI supports uh, Scala, so you can, you, know, you can write Scala code in the Spark CLI. Um, Scala, Scala is also a statically typed language, so it's pretty uh, efficient. Um, so the main uh, the main way Spark deals with uh, reusing data is this concept of resi resilient distributed data sets, or RDDs. Um, RDDs allow applications to keep data sets that uh, are repeatedly reused in memory instead of reading it from disk. Uh, so they retain. So Spark retains all the attractive properties of MapReduce, such as fault tolerance and uh, scalability, while also trying to keep as much data in memory, uh, keep keep as much data that's reused in memory as possible, so that it keeps your job. So the the Spark job to run faster. Uh, so basically, uh, these RDDs are immutable and they are partitioned. Uh, you can create an RDD by transforming another RDD. Uh, Spark keeps track of all these transformations that you perform, and the only time it actually do, does any work is when you perform an action, such as like a count or a reduce. So each time you transform an RDD, not, nothing happens until you actually perform an action. Uh, 
since Spark keeps track of all the transformations you perform, if a partition is lost, it knows how to recompute that partition based on the lineage. Uh, you can also cache RDB. So let's say you have an RDB that you're repeatedly querying. Instead of repeatedly loading it from disk, you can cache it in memory so that your queries are much faster. And you can we'll demonst demonstrate this in, in the demo. Uh, so the Phoenix Spark connector, we have an existing uh, Phoenix Spark connector that's based on data source V1 which was released in uh, uh, Spark 2.0, I think. Uh, but Spark already supports JDC, JDBC, uh, but there's a disadvantage of just using the JDBC interface in that it only parallelizes the uh, queries on numeric columns, and then you need to specify the lower bound and the upper bound and the number of splits. Uh, so if you use the Phoenix Spark connector to query data in Phoenix, you'll automatically parallelize the queries based on splits that Phoenix provides either per region or if stats enabled, we split within a region per guidepost, similarly to you know, what the MapReduce uh, integration does. Uh, so the, the connector also supports column projection and uh, simple filter pushdown. So if you are only querying a subset of columns of your data, we'll only return that, those column values back to you and we also try to uh, push the, we, we also filter data back uh, with, you know, in Phoenix itself, instead of running the filters in Spark. So this is uh, the main class that implements the data source V1 interface. We have a base relation class and a prune filter scan mixin in, uh, trait. And the main thing that we, that we are doing here is we are building a scan that the scan takes in the list of columns that you're interested in and the filters that you want to push down into the data source. Uh, and it returns an RVD. Uh, we also have to, we also implement this class also returns the schema, which is a mapping from, you know, Phoenix's data types to the Spark struct type. And it also uh, lists the filters. Let's say it, uh, Phoenix couldn't handle some of the filters that were pushed down, we return the list of filters back to Spark saying, Spark needs to filter on the data that's returned back from Phoenix because Phoenix could not filter on that particular filter. And the way uh, we did this is uh, there's a new Hadoop RDD uh, class that's in, that Spark provides that uses uh, ba the basic MapReduce API, uh, which is a, re a record reader, an input split, and an input split. So we kind of reused our existing uh, MapReduce uh, in modules, module classes to, to do the you know, to implement the Phoenix Spark connector. So it was fairly straightforward, basically. We, had, we just used this API and we were able to reuse a bunch of uh, code that we already used uh, in the MapReduce uh, module. But there's, uh, so the, the data source V1 interface doesn't support uh, any complex pushdowns like pushing down the limit or aggregates, even though Phoenix has server-side code that will, that will try to filter, that will try to uh, pre-aggregate data and then return it back, return data back from the region servers that are already aggregated. Uh, also, there's no way to report stats information back to Spark so that it can do, uh, so that it, you know the, the optimizer can figure out which queries, which table it wants to reorder during joins, or if there are any uh, indexes that are on the table, it doesn't know that it can use the indexes if that's if it's more efficient to query on the index. Also, it's very tightly coupled with the RDD API. Uh, and so because of this, the from Spark, from Spark 2.3, there's a new data source V2 API that we decided to integrate with. That API is in Java, so it's a lot simpler to, to use. Uh, it basically has a bunch of interfaces that you can implement. Uh, so here is the example of how we implemented scans. There's a data source reader interface. Uh, we had to say this, you know, this, the scheme of the table that we are reading and the how the data is partitioned. And let's, uh, and Phoenix supports pushdown filtering and column projection. So we implement the supports pushdown filters and the support uh, pushdown required columns interface. That basically says, uh, uh, tell Spark which filters that we handle and which, uh, uh, which columns, which columns we project into, into Phoenix while running the scan. Um, so there's some, so this 
API, uh, V2 API is still evolving and there's a lot of work that's still being done to in, in Spark itself so that uh, you can push down limits and aggregation into data sources. Um, there's also work being done to, uh, to support cl clustering so that, uh, so let's say you're doing writes, you can, you can say that you want the data to be ordered a certain way that'll help us to do bulk, to support bulk, bulk writing in, in Phoenix, in the Phoenix Spark connector basically. Maybe we'll uh, show you a quick demo of uh, Presto and, and Phoenix Spark. We have a few minutes left here, so we'll do a quick uh, demo. Um, so this is the documentation for the Presto Phoenix connector. Um, again, you'll, this is, says 312 snapshot, but so 312 release, um, you'll see it. Um, this is what the configuration looks like. So for the connector, you have a simple configuration file with your connector name, which is Phoenix, and then your connection URL, which is your Zookeeper uh, URL. And then you have a comma separated list of config files. Um, typically you have one, which is hbasesite.xml um, for your uh, custom Phoenix client connection property. And so um, we have a 10 node AWS cluster here. Um, and I'll show you the schema first for the data set. So we have two tables. We have a consumer table and we have a purchases table. Um, so pretty simple, a consumer can have many purchases. Um, so consumer would be things like um, the primary query is consumer number and then you have like first name, last name, email address, et cetera. And then for the purchases table, again, you have the consumer number, but then you also have like things like purchase date, purchase price, et cetera. Um, I have about 1.1 billion rows in the purchases table. And then we have, I think, something like 500 million consumers. Um, so, So typically, um, well, let me show you the catalogs I have here. So, so in Presto, you know, again, we can have multiple catalogs. So I can have a Hive, MySQL. Um, here I have Phoenix, I'm in US West right now. And then you can also have like a Phoenix East. So you can just query all of these in a single place. Um, so I have a query here. So this just kind of sh shows that um, sometimes like OLAP style queries um, are not that great in Phoenix. So this is an example where I'm filtering by purchase price on the uh, Phoenix purchases table. And that's pretty slow. So um, that's because this is essentially a full table scan because we don't have a secondary index here on purchase price, right? So um, that's just to show that that's not what Phoenix is best at. Um, but if I do the same thing in ORC, which is column oriented file format, obviously that's gonna be a lot faster, right? So even though my, so in Phoenix here, I only had 10 million rows actually, and it took 11 seconds, but over 1.1 billion rows in ORC, I did it in only four seconds because it's optimized for that, right? Um, at the same time, certain things in ORC are not optimal. So um, if I'm just want to get all the information, select star from uh, consumers in ORC uh, and filter by consumer number. Um, ORC is not the best uh, way to do that because uh, Phoenix would be a lot faster, right? So if I do that same query in Phoenix, um, you know, it just came back right away. In fact, it takes less than one second, so it says zero, zero there because it's just in the milliseconds, right? Um, now, the beauty of Presto is that you can now leverage the strength of each of these data sources and join across them, right? So I can select the consumers from Phoenix and join with my purchases in ORC. Um, and I have a query here that does that uh, as an example. So um, I have a query here that selects from my consumer table and you can see the inner join and inside I'm selecting from my Hive um, S3 purchase ORC. Um, and then of course, the nice thing about Phoenix is you can actually update your data whereas ORC is immutable. So um, since I'm querying my consumer information from Phoenix, I can update it pretty easily. So here 
um, you know, I can update Teddy's last name. Let's just say I change it to um, change this to NoSQL. And then if I do that join again, um, as we'd expect, uh, it should show the latest values. So Teddy, NoSQL. And so now uh, Thomas will do a quick demo of the Spark connector. So I'm just starting it here. So basically, um, you, you can, you know, you can query the same data in Spark as well. Uh, in this particular demo, I, um, the instead of using uh, ORC, I use Sparky because uh, I think Spark is more tuned for, for ORC. But, uh, but it, uh, the query just takes a little longer to run if you if you run it on, uh, on ORC instead of uh, instead of Sparky. Create the consumer table, um, which is basically a table in, uh, in Phoenix. There's the purchase table, which is uh, in Parquet. And this is basically the same query that uh, Wilson ran. Uh, the only thing I'm doing is I'm going to I'm going to cache this so that the second time I run it, it doesn't actually have to fetch the data from disk. Okay, so this is pretty, pretty much the same join query where we're joining the consumer and the purchase table, except it's um, doing it in Spark. And the purchase data is in uh, Parquet. So pretty much just the same thing, Teddy NoSQL, it took 22 seconds to run. Uh, but the second time you run it, because it's cached, it just gets it from memory. So yeah, that's pretty much it. Cool, any questions? How will <laughs> security? Yeah, so for Presto, um, each connector um, has their own sort of way of handling security. So um, you're essentially using the Phoenix client under the hood. So um, you set up Kerberos the same way uh, with the key tab and the principal name. Yeah. Yes, yeah, there's no, um, that's right. There's no, we, we could do that, um, but we could do that impersonation, but uh, we don't uh, do that right now. Right now, um, all we have for Kerberos is you as part of, as part of your config. Yeah. Yeah, for Spark, it's the same thing. We don't do the impersonation right now. Do you think is there any side effect versus uh, any good? You can effect? use the data frame API. Okay. So it's um, the so that you know as long as you implement your data source, you can use whichever Spark API you want. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Any thoughts on Phoenix Hive connector versus Phoenix Presto connector? So we, I haven't like evaluated 
the higher connector versus the spark connector that, that probably can have to do with it. So the, the only thing we did is we, uh, so there's a spark SQL perf uh, benchmark that Databricks uh, provides. So we tried, we tried running that uh, and you know, you can do a lot more. So you can, so using the, the connector, you can, you can run all these TPCH queries, but I didn't actually evaluate that as a high in supplemental engineers before trying. Thank you.